All right, good afternoon, everybody. This afternoon, we are so honored to have Fred Gray with us, who is our keynote speaker. It's been an honor to work with Mr. Gray and his team, June, to get this presentation to you. As you see, we are in a webinar format. So if you have any questions during this uh, session, please use the ask a question feature Q&A at the bottom, and uh, we will get to those as we go along. Uh, at this time, I will be introducing you to Nicole Gritta, International Marshal, who will be providing the introduction and the uh, moderation of the discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, sisters and brothers. Nicole Gritta, International Marshal, Sanford Chapter. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Fred Gray, civil rights attorney, author, and speaker. Mr. Gray, a native of Montgomery, Alabama, is a landmark setting civil rights lawyer. Educated at Nashville Christian Institute, Alabama State University, and Case Western Reserve University, his legal career spans a time period of over 60 years. Enthusiastic, energetic, and out of law school less than a year, he began a dynamic civil rights career in 1954. His first civil rights case was representation of Claudette Colvin, a 15-year-old African-American high school student who refused to give up her seat on a city bus in Montgomery, Alabama in March, 1955. In December, 1955, he represented Mrs. Rosa Parks, who was arrested because she refused to give up her seat on a bus to a white man, igniting the Montgomery bus boycott. He was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s first civil rights attorney. Upon receipt of a copy of his book, Bus Ride to Justice, President Barack Obama wrote in a letter to Mr. Gray, today we stand on the shoulders of giants who helped move us toward a more perfect union. And I appreciate you sharing your story. In 1997, he encouraged the President of the United States to make an official apology to the participants of this Tuskegee syphilis study, which President Clinton made at the White House in May of that year. Mr. Gray was the moving force in the establishment of the Tuskegee Human Rights, Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center in Tuskegee, Alabama. Mr. Gray filed suits that integrated all state institutions of higher learning in the state of Alabama and 104 of them of the then 121 elementary and secondary school systems in the state. He was counsel in preserving and protecting the rights of persons involved in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. In July of 1993, he argued on behalf of Alabama State University in which the court held that there were still vestiges of racial discrimination in higher education in Alabama. The list of civil rights cases that Mr. Witt, Mr. Gray won can be found in most constitutional law textbooks and are far too long to list here today. He has lectured on local, state, national, and international levels. He was also one of the first African Americans to serve in the Alabama legislature since Reconstruction, serving from 1970 to 1974. His love and commitment in promoting the works of the National Bar Association gave him recognition as its 43rd president, where he served from 1985 to 1986. In 1996, the American Bar Association bestowed upon Mr. Gray its Spirit of Excellence Award, which celebrates the achievements of lawyers of color and their contributions to the legal profession. It also recognizes their commitment to pave the way to success for other lawyers of color and commemorates the rich diversity that lawyers of color bring to the legal profession and to society. Mr. Gray was the first person of color elected president of the Alabama State Bar Association and served as its 126th president from 2002 to 2003. The number of awards and accolades that Mr. Gray has received during his illustrious career would leave us with very little time to hear from him today. But I would encourage you to read his full biography posted on our website, 
Without further ado, brothers and sisters, it is my absolute privilege and honor to introduce Fred Gray. Mr. Gray. Thank you very much, Nicole. I appreciate those wonderful remarks. They tell me that introductions like that is somewhat like liniment. It's good to rub on, but not to take in. But in any event, I am delighted and I want to express my appreciation to Mr. Sagan. I want to express my appreciation to Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity for inviting me to share with you in your annual convention. I realize that this convention this year is a little different than any other you have had, but that's the way it is sometimes with the practice of law. You have surprises and you have unexpected witnesses and you have to just adjust to them. So I am very delighted to be with you today. Let me thank all those persons who have played a role in any way in uh, making this arrangement so I could speak with you. I particularly want to thank my stepdaughter, June Poto, who has really worked on this technology. She's come all the way from Atlanta over here to do it, and I appreciate it. I also appreciate my son, Stanley, who was kind of standing by in case we needed him and appreciate all of you for what you've done. I also acknowledge the presence of my wife, Carol, who graciously has yielded her uh, home, our home, to be able to share it with you today. I've been asked to initially to talk, talk a little bit about uh, how I got involved in the legal profession talk a little bit about some of our cases to kind of see where we are now, how far we have come. Then I think we'll have some questions and answers. You have to remember that I was born December 14th, 1930. That will be 90 years on December 14th. And I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy, where Jefferson Davis took the oath of office and where the civil rights, current civil rights movement, many historians say started with the arrest of Mrs. Parks in 1955. So during my young years, everything in Alabama, in the South and almost in this country was completely segregated based on race. That was basically a white community and a black community. I knew very few white persons, except the lady that my mother worked for. I am the youngest of five children. My father died when I was two. My mother had very little formal education. But she told all five of us, and my father died when I was two, and I said that. But my mother told me we could be anything we wanted to be if we did three things. One, to keep Christ first in our lives. Two, to stay in school and get a good education. And three, stay out of trouble. I tried to do all of those. So as I was growing up in Montgomery, uh, during the 40s and 50s, I didn't know any lawyers, but I always wanted, but there were only about two professions that black young boys in Montgomery could look forward to, and is, and that is, it could either be a preacher or a teacher. So I decided I was going to try to be both. They tell me when I was quite young, I used to baptize cats and dogs. And we had a preacher who was from Tennessee who knew about an African-American Church of Christ school up in Nashville, Tennessee. And he thought that I could develop into a preacher because my mother didn't have any money, but somehow they arranged it where I could go up to Nashville I went up to the Nashville Christian Institute in Nashville for the purpose of becoming a preacher. And I went up when I was 12 and we had a pioneer preacher 
who decided when he became president of the school, he had two responsibilities, one to raise money for it and two to recruit students. And he thought he would take these little boy preachers and as he traveled around the Southeast to these black churches of Christ, that uh, he would recruit students and raise money. I must was pretty good. I was selected as one of those students. So when I was 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, I traveled throughout the Southeast with him. When I finished in 1948 in Nashville, I knew a little something about preaching. I then returned home to Montgomery and was going to become a teacher. Alabama State College for Negroes is what is now Alabama State University in Montgomery is located. It then was and is still located on the east side of Montgomery. I lived on the west side of Montgomery in the ghetto section. I lived in an area where nothing good was supposed to come out of Washington Park and Day Street and uh, Hill Street, West Jeff Davis in Montgomery, Alabama. But I had to use the public transportation system in Montgomery in order to get from the west side of town to the east side of town. And the first 10 seats were always reserved for white people. And then when white people took up those seats, they would ask blacks to give up other seats. While I had no problem personally on the buses as I traveled and used it from some time as little as twice a day to as much as six or eight times a day, I saw other persons who were asked to give up their seats. And we had some real problems. One man as a result of an altercation with a bus driver was killed. So we had problems on the buses. So I made a commitment while I was a student at Alabama State between 1948 and 1951 when I graduated, that in addition to becoming a preacher, they tell me, and I didn't know any lawyers, but lawyers are supposed to help people with problems. I felt that we and black people in Montgomery at that time had a problem with buses and they needed some help. Mr. E.D. Nixon, who was a former president of the NAACP and the state conference of branches and was a Pullman and he was doing all he could to help uh, black people, but he was always looking for lawyers and he encouraged me to be a lawyer. While I didn't know any lawyers, I made a commitment while I was a teenager, that I was going to finish Alabama State College and was going to go to law school someplace. I wasn't going to apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't accept me and I didn't want to raise any sand. And at that time, if you wanted to go to a professional school, or to graduate school that course is not offered at the historical black school uh, college, but offered at Auburn or, or University of Alabama, the state of Alabama would pay a portion of your tuition room and board in order not to go to the white schools. So I decided I would take advantage of that. And I made a secret commitment. And that commitment was I was gonna to go to law school finish law school, come back to Alabama, take the Alabama bar exam, pass the bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. That is what I decided. And the best thing about that commitment is I didn't tell anybody all of it. I told them I was going to law school. I told them I was gonna come back to Alabama to practice but I didn't tell them the kind of law that I wanted to practice. And I think it was my advantage. I finished Alabama State in May of 51, enrolled in Western Reserve University, now Case Western in Cleveland in September of 51. Graduated from uh, Western Reserve University in uh, June of 54 and decided to stop by Columbus, Ohio, just in case and take the 
Ohio bar exam. Six weeks later, I took the Alabama bar exam. And in August of 1954, I was told by both the Supreme Court of Ohio and the Supreme Court of Alabama that I had passed the bar examination and was licensed to practice in Montgomery, Alabama and in the state of Alabama on September the 7th, 1954. And I have been practicing law in this state since that time. I am now ready to become, to begin destroying everything segregated I could find. I was just several problems with that, even after I had passed the bar. One, nobody would hire me because there were no, there were only seven black lawyers in Alabama when I was admitted to practice. And most of those seven were in and around Birmingham and there was only one in Montgomery. No law firm would hire me, no governmental agency would hire me. So I had to begin on my own and open a law practice. I opened a little law practice, invited all the people in the community and I had met Mrs. Rosa Parks who was the secretary and who also was the youth director of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. And I knew Mr. Nixon uh, he was Mr. Silver Rice, if you had a problem, and he had encouraged me to go to law school. So they all helped me. I had a little open house, borrowed some books from some other lawyers in town, and opened my law practice. And in less than six months, I had my first civil rights case. And it wasn't most of you heard about Rosa Parks, and you heard about the Montgomery bus boycott, you heard about a representative, Dr. King. But this was a 15 year old girl whose name was Claudette Carvin, who lived in the northeast part of the city of Montgomery, and who had to use the transportation, public transportation system to go to and from school. And she had just been studying in February of 1955, during February, that was Black History Month. And her teacher had been telling those students that you have a constitutional right to certain things. And on March 2nd, she caught the bus going back home, but she got an earlier bus than usual because the teachers were having a meeting and they let the students out earlier. So on this bus that she usually didn't have any problems, there were more white people than usual. She took a seat, not in the first 10 seats that were always reserved, but in a seat farther back, almost in front of the back door. But white people came on, the bus driver asked her to give up her seat, she told them that she'd been studying about Blacks had constitutional rights. She wasn't seated in the first 10 seats. And she said, I am not in the segregated section. I'm, I'm not in the one that I'm not supposed to be in. And she wouldn't move. The other three students who were sitting on seats moved, but Claudette didn't. She was arrested. Her parents knew nothing about Fred Gray because it all had been practicing about nine months or six months. But they knew about E.D. Nixon. They contacted him, he contacted me, and I represented Claudette. Not only did Rosa Parks come to her rescue, but there was a lady named Joanne Robinson, who was a teacher at Alabama State, who was then the president of the Women's Political Council, a black organization of educated women who was doing everything they could. They had a meeting with the bus company officials and the city officials about Claudette Carvin's case. And when they got me to represent them, I went in in my first civil rights case before Judge Hill, who was a juvenile court judge in Montgomery. <clears throat> I raised the fact, they said that she was a delinquent. 
I told her she wasn't a delinquent. She was an honored student. She was coming from school at that time. What they were trying to do was to use the disorderly conduct of the claiming her to be a delinquent child as an excuse for enforcing the segregation laws of the city of Montgomery and the state of Alabama, and that all of them are unconstitutional. Coach Judge Hill didn't listen to me. He found her to be a delinquent, but placed her on unsupervised probation. So she didn't have to report to anybody. She didn't have to do anything. But I lost Claudette case. Claudette was very sorry about that. But Joanne Robinson and Mrs. Sparks and Edie Nixon, we all decided that while we didn't win that, we were going to prepare ourselves so that the next time a case like that presents itself, we will be ready to start. That opportunity presented itself with Mrs. Rosa Parks. Mrs. Parks was not just a seamstress at the store, but she had been working with the NACP almost ever since she had been in Montgomery. And she and her husband were very interested in doing all they could. She worked about a block and a half from where my office was located. And she would come to my office about four times a week for lunch. And we would talk about what a person should do in the event something happened and if they decided not to give up their seat on the bus. In the final analysis, I knew that Mrs. Parks would have been a good person as a, a test for my case. I was ready to do it when Claudette was ready, but the community wasn't ready. But to make a long story short, on the day of Mrs. Parks' arrest, we had one of our conferences. I told her I was gonna have to go out of town and I went out of town. When I got back, I found out that Mrs. Sparks had been arrested. And I had a message asking me to come and talk with her. When I got back in town and talked to Mrs. Parks and she told me what had happened, this was on Thursday evening now, her case was set in the recorder's code of the city of Montgomery for that following Monday at 8.30. And she wanted me to represent her. I said, well, Mrs. Parks, I'm gonna do that. I said, but in addition to representing you, Mr. Nixon had been instrumental in getting her out of jail. So I said, I'm gonna go and talk to Mr. Nixon. And she also knew about Joanne Robinson. I said, I'm gonna talk to her because I said, we need to stop the problems that we're having on the buses. Not only do we need to take care of your case, but the community needs to get involved. And that's what Joanne Robinson had been saying. But I told her, don't worry about your case. I'm going to take care of it and we'll be ready. I left, went and talked to Mr. Nixon at his house, told him I'd gone and talked to Miss Parks and he knew I was going to talk with her. And I told him that not only should we do that, but we should get prepared and get the community involved. And he said, well, Fred, you know, you go ahead and do what you need to do. I said, I'm going to talk to Joanne Robinson because she has been saying, get the community involved in addition to anything else. I learned and talked to Joanne Robinson. We talked and made the plans in Joanne Robinson's living room on the evening of December 1st and December 2nd uh, for the Montgomery bus boycott. I don't have time to tell you all of that, but if you get a copy of Bus Ride to Justice, you'll see how we laid the foundation, how we arranged it, that while we are gonna take care of Mrs. Park's case, I know I'm gonna lose it, I'm gonna appeal it, but we're gonna keep, see if the people won't stay off of the buses. We can't tell them to stay off until they can go on a non-segregated basis, but we're going to tell them to stay off at least for one day. And we did that. And we made the plans which resulted in the formation of the Montgomery Improvement Association, the selection of Dr. King to be the leader, the beginning of the bus boycott. And after Mrs. Ark's case was tried and convicted and appealed, and after we had that mass meeting at Hope Street Baptist Church, 
introduced Dr. King to the community. Again, the bus boycott, which was lasted for 382 uh, years, 382 days, and resulted in the beginning of the civil rights movement. Now, you know the rest of the story. But I want you to know in that bus boycott, a young person, Claudette Calvin, was involved in it. And ultimately, Mary Louise Smith, another youngster, was involved in it and were ultimately in cases that I found Browder versus Gale, which also included Mary Louise Smith and Claudette Calvin and several other persons. But my work on the Montgomery bus boycott was just the beginning of a long career that has resulted, as you heard from the introduction, not only the desegregation of the buses and the parks, but also all of the institutions of higher learning in the state of Alabama. I also represented the men in the Tuskegee syphilis study, and you heard about that. And say almost to Montgomery March, when they were beaten back on Bloody Sunday, they called me and I went over. And the next day, after, before the close of day on Monday, I filed the case of Jose Williams and uh, John Lewis versus Governor Wallace, which resulted in the court entering an order so that they could march from Selma to Montgomery, which resulted in the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So I am glad that the lawsuit I filed on behalf of these persons, including John Lewis, resulted in the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which, just, uh, which President Johnson signed into law some over 50 years ago on the 6th of August in 1965. Now you know, and you have heard basically about some of these cases that I have handled. But that was just the beginning of what we tried to do. I want to mention one other thing, and I know I need to stop because my time is far from <laughs> is over. But let me say this, in addition to all the civil rights work, I have also been very active in bar, my state bar association. And I say this because this is a fraternity of lawyers and law students. And you need to become an active part in your local bar association. I ended up becoming president of two national organizations. One, I became president of the National Bar Association, the largest African-American minority bar in this country in 1930. Uh, I was the 34th president in 1985. Then I was the 127th president of the Alabama State Bar Association, became its president in 2002. While I was National Bar Association president, I saw so many black lawyers who had been practicing law for many years and they were never recognized. So I recommended to our board of, bar of governors of the National Bar Associations to start an NBA Lawyers Hall of Fame, recognizing these lawyers who had made substantial contributions to their clients for over 40 years. And they did that. It became a national institution, and every year since 1985, they have had that association. When I became the 127th president of the Alabama State Bar Association, I, and I never thought of becoming president of that association because it was that association that tried to disbar me on any, any number of occasions. But later, it became to their advantage for me to be president, and I was selected without opposition to be the 27th president. But there were several things I wanted to do while I was president, and I just want to tell you about them. One, 
is I didn't know many of the persons, but I knew lawyers run the service. And the reason I became a lawyer is because lawyers run the service. So I created a theme that I worked on and had CLE co courses during that whole year. And at the end of that year, when the next president became president, uh, young Clark of Birmingham, he says, I'm not going to have a theme for it, but I'm going to use your theme, lawyers run the service, and recommend to the board of, a, uh, gov the board of, of governors of the Alabama State Bar Association, I'm going to recommend to them to create it, lawyers run the service, as a motto for the Alabama State Bar Association. When you get a letter from the Alabama State Bar Association, you will see on it the motto, lawyers run the service. It didn't tell you that was Fred Gray's theme, but that's where it came from. Secondly, we had diversity on the Alabama State Bar. We had the Board of Bar Commissioners, and there were 60 elected and there had only been one at a time of African-American, and I was the first, and we had a few more. So I recommended to our board of our commissioners, and we had to get legislation to increase the number of seats, some at-large states on the board of our commissioners by nine, so that there would be an opportunity to have more diversity. And it took the legislation, but it happened in the next year. Now, each year on Law Day in Alabama in the Supreme Court, they end up initiating at least four members into the Alabama Lawyers Hall of Fame on Law Day. And then that was one other thing that I, 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 I wanted to be sure that we did. Uh, that's when we had the Lawyers Hall of Fame with NBA. I wanted to see that they did that of the state of Alabama. So then I say to you, lawyers become actively involved in the bar association of your respective states. And I think I've talked long enough, so let me stop at this point. But I challenge you, and the challenge, the first challenge I wanna leave with you is that it is important that you work in these associations and because it helps your client, it helps the community, and it helps the profession. I challenge those of you who are not actively involved in your bar associations at all levels to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Gray. We've gotten many, many questions. Um, in the Q&A here today, and I would just remind all of uh, our attendees that to please type your question in the Q&A and not in the chat so that we have all the questions in one place. Um, we also did receive questions ahead of your discussion in the Whova app, and I will be doing my best to answer as many of the questions or ask as many of the questions, uh, and hopefully we can get to most of them. Um, I think our first question, um, Mr. Gray, that was submitted ahead of time was, how would you compare the current Black Lives Matter movement to the civil rights movement that you've talked about here today? Well, what you have to understand is uh, my, my role in the civil rights movement was to serve as a lawyer. I wasn't to serve as an activist. I wasn't to serve as a motivating factor we had the responsibility during the early part of my practice of filing lawsuits to have unconstitutional these laws which required segregation in every aspect of American life. So that is what me and other lawyers during my period decided. But the problem that we were trying to evolve was the same problem, and that is racism and inequality. So as you go through the civil rights movement, and even before 1955, you'll find those lawyers who were involved in it, Thurgood Marshall and those other uh, lawyers, they had filed lawsuits 
getting and gradually destroying segregation. Now the Black Lives Matter movement, to tell you the truth, I don't know the details about that. I don't know, uh, I, I have met some of the people connected with it, but exactly, I know what it's trying to do, and they're trying to do the same thing we tried to do, and that is to do away with racism and to do away with inequality. And to the extent, when you says, uh, how would I compare it? What they are doing is simply building on lawyers and lawyers before me had already been building on, and that is destroying uh, racism and destroying inequality. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, we've received a question. What can we as lawyers and law students do to ensure diversity, equity, inclusion in the legal field, as well as in our interactions with clients? Uh, I can tell you what I did. I saw a problem on the buses in Montgomery as a teenager and decided I would become a lawyer and file lawsuits to destroy it. And to some extent, I think I have been able to do some of that. And I, I get questions like that all the time and I get questions from lawyers and people are telling me, say, lawyer, what can we do now to solve these problems? You know what I tell them? I said, nobody told Fred Gray what to do when he was a teenager. He saw a problem and he recognized the problem and he went ahead and did something about it. So we still have those two basic problems. You lawyers now, you have all these computers and all these uh, electronics and all of these things. Don't ask me or any other civil rights lawyer, what you ought to do. Look at it. If you can look at what we did in the civil rights movement, for example, we observed and saw the problems that were before us. We then talked with other people about it and got their opinion before we started doing something. Then we sat down like Joanne Robinson and I did in her living room and, and, and made the plans for the bus boycott in Montgomery. And after making the plans, we got other people involved in it and executed the plans. And then we were able to be successful, but we got everybody involved. Everybody didn't try to do the same thing. And the civil rights movement, you found that were some people, uh, most of the folks were not lawyers, but the lawyers did the law work. The president who could make speeches did the speeches. The people who could demonstrate, demonstrated. And we all worked together cooperatively and resulted in what was the beginning of what some people call the modern civil rights movement and the election of the first African-American president of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Gray mentioned just now that everyone had a different role to play. Um, that's consistent with one of the questions we received, which was, what do you see as the role of legal organizations such as ours in promoting social, social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion? It's the same uh, what I've just said, and I can't, I cannot, and I wouldn't dare sit here and try to outline every problem that we can try to solve. But what I can tell us is this, the root of it is racism and inequality. All the other things you can do and whatever other matters you can bring up. And I think what has taken place recently certainly contributes substantially and now that you have people talking about and recognizing the problem, they ought to be able to work on it towards solving it. Uh, 
what would you say to people that want to see change, but they don't want to put in the effort or the energy to help change? Well, everybody wants problems to be solved, but most people don't want to solve them. Uh, I think, and I will end up in the latter part of my little speech, telling you at least four things that I think that we need to do today. And so you won't be surprised. Those four things will be uh, basically simply expanding on the two things I've already talked about, racism and inequality. And I keep saying it because those are the, the root problems. And until we recognize them as problems and this country has never undertaken to solve those problems. And that's where we need to be, that's what we need to be looking at. And whatever we're doing and whatever, whatever you want to call it, you know, you had the sit-ins, you had the, the, the bus rides, you've had freedom walks, you've had all of these things. And they, they call them various things and they come up with different names. And the reason for giving them names is so you can motivate people into doing away with racism and inequality. But we have to get involved in it and we can't leave it up to someone else to get involved. Do you feel that we're taking steps backwards at this moment in history from all the work that you did in light of the current state of the nation and the events that we've seen most recently? No, I don't think we're taking the step backwards. I think we are, I think we are still trying to solve the same problems that started when the slaves landed in Jamestown, Virginia in what was it, 1607. So it's the same problems. It's just that the country never really went, went to the root of it. You've always just chipped away. We've done a little bit and we still haven't finished it, but the struggle for equal justice continues. So I want to change gears just a little bit, Mr. Gray. Um, we have a question from one of our members who graduated from the University of Alabama, and she's curious, what changes would you still make to the university since defending Vivian Malone and James Hood? Well, I'm not going to try to get involved in trying to suggest what someone should do at any one particular university. What I would suggest is that people at that university and other universities across the nation who are interested in solving these problems, who are interested in doing away with racism and interested in doing away with inequality, talk to those people, work with those people, you'll find once you begin to talk about it, uh, and that's why I think it's so important that the conversation continues as a result of the killings that we have had. We've had these kind of things and these problems with police officers long before now. But somehow, it's, this one was so atrocious until we've all concluded that we need to do something about it. And I'm glad to see that something is being talked about, but we can't just talk about it. We have to go ahead and do whatever it takes in order to complete it. So that's a good uh, segue to this next question, Mr. Gray. Um, it has a preface, so I wanna read that for you. In the current climate, as we continue to see racial injustice and unrest, it is easy to get discouraged about the vast amount of work and collective community involvement. What would be your recommendation to keep the community consistently involved in acts such as boycotts or protests? How do we keep that involvement up from day one to day 300 plus? Well, I'm gonna address that problem in just a few moments in my closing remarks. I think it's a very good question and uh, I want to let you know that the struggle for equal justice continues and uh, we'll try to address that at that time and not do it twice. 
Fair enough, Mr. Gray. Uh, we have a question about um, your experiences and interactions with Bayard Rustin as he struggled with issues of diversity and inclusion in the 1960s. The member is asking if you can just provide us with some of your thoughts on that. Well, I had relatively very little experience with Bayard Rustin. I know Bayard Rustin, he was the executive assistant of uh, uh, Randolph, A. Philip Randolph, uh, who <clears throat> was the labor leader for the Pullman Carpolos. But I came in contact with Bayard Rustin. He was on the committee that was prepared to defend Dr. Martin Luther King when after he left Montgomery and went to Georgia and started the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the state of Alabama decided to bring charges against Dr. King for perjury as a result of the income tax, state income tax uh, returns that he filed in Alabama while he was a resident here. And I was included <laughs> in a group of lawyers who raised funds to raise to try Dr. King. And I was selected as one of, I think it was about, about four law firms that were involved in it, including the Hubert Delaney out of New York, uh, uh, lawyer, a tax lawyer over in Chicago. Can't think of his name right this minute. And uh, then there was one other lawyer in, in Alabama. But we successfully, and right in the middle of the civil rights movement in, in the spring of 1960, right before these, the uh, Freedom Riders came into Montgomery when John Lewis was beaten at the, at the Greyhound bus station, uh, we tried that case before an all-white jury and ended up getting Dr. Martin Luther King exonerated in the state of Alabama. So uh, even in the midst, and I think it was the most important case against Dr. King because he was then uh, fighting about against the Vietnam War. And if they had proven that while he was talking about all this civil rights and at the same time cheating on his state income tax, it could have been devastating. And I'm glad we was able to do it. And Bayard Rustin was one of the ones, I think, who worked on raising funds for the defense of Dr. King in that case. And he probably did a lot of other things. But I had very little direct connection. You see, my, my problem and my whole idea was to solve problems in the state of Alabama. And the persons that I had most of my contact with in all of my civil rights cases were basically Alabamians, because I think ultimately the control of these communities to a great degree and how we work certainly needs to have the community involved and the community needs to be at the core of helping to solve the problem. We have a question. Um, as a civil rights attorney, how do you decide which is the plaintiff to choose in challenging discriminatory laws? How do you choose your plaintiff? How do you bring your case? Well, of course, I was a lawyer that was representing individuals. Usually there were organizations involved and there weren't too many organizations when I started out. The NACP was one. Later, the Legal Defense Fund of the NACP came into being. Then when Dr. King uh, uh, left Montgomery, he started the Christian Leadership Conference because he didn't have an organization then because the Montgomery Improvement Association was primarily to do away with buses. So I usually dealt with local individuals and the local organizations would have the responsibility of finding the type persons in the community that the lawyers would approve to serve as plaintiffs. And after they would find these people, 
and we would look at them and have them to come in to be sure that they wanted us to represent them because I was indicted for allegedly representing one of the persons in the federal suit that integrated the buses. A lady said that I didn't have her consent. The truth of the matter is I did, but I'm saying that was one of the things that we went about. So the matter of the selection is something that the community become involved in. And then ultimately, if I'm gonna be the lawyer, whoever the lawyer is, that lawyer has to satisfy himself that this person who he is selecting because it's, it's his client and he'll have to control that client and he'll have to be sure that that client will do what the court says it could do. And I was very careful in, in ultimately being the one, you know, I'm gonna sign my name on this complaint as lawyer for you as plaintiff and I'm going to be sure that I understand and you understand what you're doing and you understand the consequences of what you're doing. And I think lawyers still need to do that today. It's not the lawyer's case, it's the client's case. Thank you. Um, this question came in on the app ahead of time. Phi Alpha Delta has yet to have a black member serve as its international justice, which is our president, or in any significant role on our board. Would you be willing to speak to some of the challenges you faced on your path to becoming the first African-American president of the Alabama State Bar? I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the, the, the specific question you're asking on that. I'll, I'll ask it again, the last part. Can you tell us about the challenges you faced as being the first president of the Alabama State Bar, first African-American president? Okay. Number one, I tried to avoid having problems as the first bar president. The way I was approached, because I was the last thing I ever thought I would be would be president of the Alabama State Bar Association. I was a white female lawyer from Birmingham who I uh, was working with at one time a large defense fund, and they had some cases in our part of the state, in Bullock County and Macon County and around. And uh, we had held several cases for them. And when the Birmingham, we were having an annual state meeting in Birmingham, and I went to those meetings. When I got to the hotel, I happened to have seen this lady and, uh, at the hotel. And she stopped me before I could check in and said, look, I have some people I want you to meet because I, want, I think you ought to be state bar president. And when I got a chance to talk to her, I said, now, what are you talking about? You want me to put my neck out about state bar president and the members of the, the white members of the bar is gonna have to elect me? I, uh, I told her, she introduced me to a lot of people and I talked to a lot of people. Then I later found out that some people who were established power brokers in the bar was interested in me being bar president. Well, I told them, I said, look, you all know about the bar association and about its politics. I don't. But you if you all think I can be and make a good bar president for the state and you want me to do it, I'll consider it. But let me tell you to begin with, I'm not gonna voluntarily put my noose, my neck in a noose, my, in, a, in a noose by putting it out on the line. If you want me to be president, the only way I'll run is I'll have to run uncontested because if a white lawyer qualifies against me, raise my civil rights record, I'm gonna lose. The system we have is, and it's pretty simple. You circulate a petition, get at least 25 members. And if you get at least 25 members to sign a petition for you, you would go on the ballot as president. And I did that and forgot about it. 
then I got a call from the person who was then the executive director late one afternoon, and he says, Fred, uh, the board of bar commissioners have just finished meeting, and I just want to call you to congratulate you on being president-elect uh, uh, nom president nominee that your petition was received and you had no opposition, so you're it. So I thank you. So uh, I, I didn't force myself on them, but I didn't run away from what brought me there. It was diversity and civil rights which brought me there. And that was one of the things we were able to have changed by adding nine additional slots to the membership on the board of bar commissioners for the purpose of diversity. I hope that answer helped to some degree. Thank you, Mr. Gray. I do see all of your questions in the Q&A, and I know I haven't gotten to all of them on the Whova app, but I'm going to try to conclude with one last question at this time. Um, I feel that we would be remiss if we didn't ask you to share your thoughts um, with us about two civil rights giants that we've lost recently, John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. What can we learn from their lives work? I'm sorry. Ask that again, I'm sorry. I missed it. That's okay. Um, I was just that we're, we're running out of time in our Q&A, but I wanted to conclude with a final question. Your thoughts on what we can learn from the, life, from the lives of John Lewis and C.T. Vivian? Well, I think both of them were outstanding individuals. I did more personal work with John Lewis than I did with V.C. Vivian. Both of them worked in the, in the Nashville area. But uh, my first contact with John Lewis was in 1958. He wrote a letter to Dr. King. He lived in Troy, 50 miles from Montgomery, I had read about and listened to the radio about the Montgomery bus boycott. He knew about Dr. King's leading it. He had heard to a lesser degree about the young lawyer, Fred Gray, who was doing the legal work for him. And when he wrote the letter to Dr. King, he told him that he lived in Troy and he wanted to go to Troy State College. That was a white state community college in his community. Only thing is, no educational institution statewide or uh, state supported was integrated. So it would have meant desegregating Troy State in the heart of a racist community. Dr. King sent him a ticket, bus ride, a round trip ticket from Troy to Montgomery. He called me and said, Fred, there's a boy from Troy who I sent him a ticket. You want to go to Troy State. If you will meet him at the bus station, he want to talk about that. And we want to see about whether or not you'll file a lawsuit so he can go to Troy State. I said, Dr. King, be glad to do it. I met him. So that day I met John Lewis, who was then about 17 or 18 years of age. He, uh, I took him to Reverend Abernathy's church, First Baptist Church, where Dr. King was in a meeting. He discussed with us, the three of us, about what he wanted to do. Dr. King told him, and so did I, that he's very courageous. We appreciate that. Uh, but I also told him that he was a minor and his parents would have to sign the lawsuit for him. So he said, well, he'll go back home and talk to his parents. He went back, make a long story short, he contacted Dr. King and told Dr. King he was sorry, but his parents said that the white people down in Pike County, Alabama, uh, would put so much pressure on he and his family that he didn't think he would be able to, to stand it. But that didn't stop John. John had already before then, and I didn't know it at the time, but he had already took a group of 
his own siblings and others to the library, the public library in Troy and tried to use it because it was just for whites, so he couldn't use it. But he went to Nashville to the American Baptist Theological Seminary and Fisk University. They came involved in the civil rights movement up there. And then two years later, in 1960, when the Freedom Riders had started from Nashville and the bus was destroyed in Anniston, the students in Nashville, including John Lewis, decided that they wanted to complete the task. They went to Birmingham, got on a bus, came to Montgomery. When they got there, they were beaten back at the same bus station that two years before I had met him. And so as a result of that, two or three days later, we filed a lawsuit, John Lewis versus Greyhound Corporation, which resulted in the desegregation of all of the uh, restaurants and the facilities on travel in industry as well as intrastate travel. Then I had met him, uh, you know, John was involved and he was the youngest person, I believe, who spoke at the March on Washington. I had met him in Nashville because I had gone to high school in Nashville. So I met him there. Then I had also met him uh, in Atlanta when the, the uh, thing, I'll, I'll have a picture here of it. I have. Oh yes, here it is. If you can see that. Uh, that was the, I think the, 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act that we that the Atlanta Bar Association had. So then the last personal contact I had with John Lewis was at the Library of Congress on the 4th of December of last year when they unveiled the papers and documents of my client Mrs. Rosa Parks and both John Lewis and myself were instrumental in, uh, uh, in participating in that program. Then my last conversation with him was on the eighth day of July of this year, just about seven or eight days before his death. His chief of staff called me and said, uh, Mr. Gray, the representative is not doing well and he wanted to talk with you. We set up a meeting for that next day. We talked. He talked about our first meeting. He talked about the fact that he appreciated my willingness to file a suit for Troy State that he never signed. He talked about the work that he'd done. He expressed to me his appreciation for what I'd done. And then I asked him, I said, Representative, what do you what do you really want? And he said, if uh, those of us who may be here, uh, when you may no longer be with us, he says, for me to keep going, keep pressing, and keep the record straight. So he told us to keep moving, keep going, keep fighting. And that's his lesson to us today. If we're going to do what John Lewis did, and John Lewis was inspired by what we did in the Montgomery bus boycott, and we keep going back to that. And he made, who would have thought when I met that 18 year old boy that there would have been six days of national mourning for the representative. He did a tremendous job. He's made a less for us, but his lesson to us is to let's keep moving and keep fighting and let's keep the record straight. Thank you, Mr. Gray. At, a, at this time, I'd ask you if, you if you'd like to make the closing remarks we talked about earlier. Now I'm gonna turn off my video so everyone can have the full benefit.
No. All right, uh, let's do. As we sit here today, 65 years after I started practicing law, and as we look back over where we have come from, including having inaugurated the first African-American president of this country, and as we look back from the time that slaves landed in Jamestown in 1607, and in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, and many others who were killed, the question remained before us, where do we go from here? And that's what I want to address just briefly. And I may mention it two or three times. First of all, we now have at least three generations of people, black and white in this country, who don't know what it meant to live in rigid segregationists, who don't know what it was to come from slavery to where we are. So the first thing we need to do is to educate these people who don't know about it, what we have come through and what African Americans have suffered from, 17, from 1607 forward. So that's the first thing. So we have museums all over this country. A lot of them are mammoth museums. But we also have small museums across the nation. It is these small museums that will educate the people so they will know what we have had to go through. The average white person has no idea what a black person goes through. We started about 20 years ago, the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center. It's a small museum in Tuskegee, Alabama. But that museum does three things. One, it seeks to educate the people and let them know the contribution made by the three ethnic groups that has occupied this country, Native Americans, Americans of European descent and Americans of African descent. If you see that under one roof, you'll know that whatever problems we have now are not nearly as great as what we have had. Secondly, it serves to show uh, and educate the, as a mem permanent memorial for the men in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. In 1972, uh, Charlie Pollard, one of the participants in the study, came in my office and explained to me what I had read in a paper a day or so earlier about these men that the federal government, I had been working all those years with the federal government against the state of Alabama to do away with discrimination, and here the federal government was engaged in a deadly deception of men, even worse than what Alabama was doing. And those men told me after I was able to get the president to make an apology to him, we want a permanent memorial. If you come to this museum, you will be able to see under the chandelier all 623 names of those men. And will be able to see the kiosk and be able to see and hear the, the uh, apology that the President Clinton made to them at the White House. And then the third role is, it gives you a brief history of the civil rights movement from slavery to date, and it points out about five outstanding cases that residents of Macon County, Alabama, where Tuskegee is located, file that has helped not only people in this county, but across the nation. So then, we need to support these museums and we want to urge you to support them and to particularly support 
the one here in Tuskegee. The struggle continues. Unfortunately, our Supreme Court now is not the same Supreme Court that we used to have because they ended up a few years ago destroying or declaring unconstitutional a part of the Voting Rights Act, which needs to be reestablished. We have our courts across the nations, the federal courts are not uh, as supportive to minority rights and women's rights as others. But in any event, I'm saying that the time must, is here when we not only must rely upon the courts, but we have to continue to use any other means we can to solve these problems. I think the challenge before us today are the same challenges we've had all the time. And those challenges are one, to do away with racism, and two, do away with inequality. This country has never really lived up to carrying out that function. If you believe that African Americans and other minorities enjoy all of the rights and privileges as a majority, I invite you to read an edition of the National Urban League report on the state of Black America, message to the president. In that report, the National Urban League states that the equity index can be interpreted as a relative status of blacks and whites in American society measured according to five areas, economics, health, education, social justice, and civic engagement. In each of these, there is a substantial disparity having a negative effect on African Americans as compared to whites. The report also states that African Americans are twice as likely as whites to be unemployed, three times more likely than whites to live in poverty, and more than 16 times as likely as whites to be incarcerated. Racism and inequality are still those number one and number two problems. Where are we today? We still have those two problems. These are the four, main, four things I want to leave you with and suggest to you. If we don't recognize we have a problem, we'll never solve it. We would never have solved our problems on the buses in Montgomery until we recognize we had a problem. There are many people because we have made the progress that we have made feel that we have arrived and even a lot, African, a lot of African Americans feel that way. But the truth of the matter is that racism and inequality is wrong. That message needs to, we need to acknowledge it. It needs to come from the top. The president needs to acknowledge the fact that it's wrong. The Supreme Court needs to acknowledge it. The Congress needs to acknowledge it. The CEO of our corporation and the president and boards of our educational institutions need to say it. So it needs to start at the top and all our fraternities and all our sororities need to do it and need to realize that racism is wrong. Once it starts there and once it comes from the top, then the second thing we have to do, we have to come up with a plan to eradicate it. This country has never come up with a plan to eradicate inequality and racism. If we had not come up, if Joanne Robinson and I had not sat in her living room on December 1st and 2nd of 1955 and made the plans for the Montgomery bus boycott, it would not have occurred on December 5th. It may have occurred some other time, but it wouldn't have been. So what I'm saying is we have to have us a plan. Once you get a plan, a plan is no good unless you do what? Unless you implement it. If we had just made a plan and then go and get other people involved in it and, and set some mechanism up to do it, it never would have been accomplished. 
but it was accomplished. And once you have a plan, and once it is, you have to implement it. Now, while it needs to start at the top, all of us need to be involved. Everybody would hope that racism and inequality would just be over. But it ain't going to happen like that. It will not happen until each one of us get involved. Not only must we make plans and execute the plans and want other people to do it and want it to come to the top, every one of us must each individually become involved. We had about 40,000 African Americans in Montgomery who participated in the bus boycott. They all became involved. The basic problem before us, and as I leave you this evening, let me give you this final message. I've already told you, you have to acknowledge that we have racism and inequality is wrong. We have to come up with a plan. We have to implement the plan. We have to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And this is my final message to you. Each of you is a leader in your community. You must be willing to give something back to your communities. You must be willing to contribute to and support worthy causes. You must show that to whom much is given, much is required. You need to take time to pass the torch of the mantle to the younger generation so that these young men and women will be able to face the challenges before them. This is what we did during the Montgomery bus boycott. You, and what I urge you today, you must do the same. These challenges include racism, inequality, and economic and political disenfranchisement, and human indignities in public schools, the corporate and business world, and individual neighborhoods. You must seek to instill in these young people that they have a life worth living and that their dreams too can become true. That all lives matters in America and in the world, including black lives. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much, Mr. Gray. Wow, I don't know about anyone else, but I've had chill bumps almost the entire time that you've spoken with us here today. Thank you so much, and I agree. To whom much is given, much is required. We do have two additional items we would like to do, Mr. Gray, before you leave us here today. The International Executive Board of Phi Alpha Delta has unanimously voted to approve you as an honorary member in our fraternity. I think your sons are both members as well, and it's an absolute privilege for me to administer the oath. Brothers and sisters, we are honored to have Fred Gray as a new member for admission to alumni membership in Phi Alpha Delta's Central Alabama Alumni Chapter. Phi Alpha Delta was founded in 1902 and exists today as a cohesive force uniting students and teachers of the law with members of the bench and bar in a professional association designed to advance the ideals of liberty and equal justice under the law, to simulate ex excellence in scholarship, to foster integrity and professional competence, to inspire the attributes of compassion and courage among our members in applying the rule of law, to promote the professional development and advancement of our members, so that each member may enjoy a lifetime of honorable professional service. The principles to which we are dedicated have been laid before you. I now ask, will you subscribe with us to them and regard yourself as a member with us in Phi Alpha Delta? Thank you very much. Mr. Gray, at this time I want to um, administer the oath that we have every member of our fraternity. So if you'd raise your hand and I'm just going to ask you to say yes once more at the end. I solemnly and sincerely promise and swear that I will support the laws and legal precepts of your country and its legal entities. 
that you will respect their courts and obey their legal mandates, that you will be just and honorable in all your professional activities, and will be faithful to those whom you represent, and that you will support the policies, rules, and precepts of Phi Alpha Delta Law Fraternity International insofar as they do not conflict with your religious or civil duties. Thank you. I do, I will. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. It's now my privilege to call you Brother Fred Gray. Thank the you. next honor that we would like to bestow upon you at this time is the presentation of the Barbara C. Jordan Award, which is one of our highest honors. This award is presented to a Phi Alpha Delta member, of which you now are, for your lifetime commitment and contributions to the rule of law and your contributions to the judicial system in keeping with the spirit of our departed sister, U.S. Congresswoman Barbara Jordan. Thank you again, Mr. Gray. It's my honor to sit with you here today and welcome to Phi Alpha Delta. Thank For you very much, else, I appreciate it. Consider us at the Multicultural Center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. For everyone else, we'll see you in general session at 4 p.m. Bye.